To provide an authentic basis for a science investigation, teachers at Wild Green Primary School have set up a crime scene, initiating their year six pupils into becoming forensic scientists overnight. Bit of fiber on the night. Here. Oh, make sure that's photographed, aren't you? All the visible evidence has been gathered, but some of the children are aware, probably from watching TV crime series, that DNA testing could help them solve the crime. The letters DNA stand for deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, I can Jane Turner from the Science Learning Centre will be helping with their investigations. We can match the DNA from uh, all our suspects' blood that we've collected and match it with the blood that we found on the door. So is being a detective really like being a scientist? The blood evidence in the school is exactly what forensic scientists use to solve crimes. Anyone thinking about taking on a CSI project needs to know the basics of DNA. And that's why Jane Turner has come to the University of Leicester for an exclusive interview. Who better to explain DNA fingerprinting than the very man who made that groundbreaking discovery in 1984? World-famous scientist, Professor Sir Alec Jeffries. If you're working with eight, ten-year-olds, how would yeah. you talk about DNA with them? Right. So, if you take a human being or, or any organism, we're all made out yeah. of cells. Each cell inside the cell has in the middle a thing called the nucleus. And inside the nucleus is the genetic material. This is a, a really complicated chemical, uh -huh. enormously long, thin chain. And that long chain carries the genetic information. And because we're all different, that exact specification it varies a little bit from one person to another. So it's a bit like a book written in a four-letter alphabet, A, C, G, and T. And how many of those letters does it take to make a human being? 6,000 million of them. So. When you made your discovery, or is it a discovery or an invention of DNA fingerprinting, yep. what, what's that then, if you can explain that? OK. Let's suppose that we're reading through the book and it, if we could translate it to say, Mary had a little lamb. Mm -hmm. One of these regions would read, has Mary had a lit, 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 little lamb. And we thought, ah, oh, these are really interesting bits of DNA because they're, they're, those stutters, I bet you anything, they're going to vary from one person to another. And that led purely by accident with what turned out to be the world's very first DNA fingerprint. Extremely variable patterns of DNA, perfectly adequate to be able to distinguish with 100% reliability, you from me, for example, but also very simply inherited. So did you know that? Just looking at, you just saw that pattern and thought, yeah, it's all there. You just could yeah, see it. Yeah, it was just so exciting. So that was my, what I call my eureka moment. Yeah. I remember hearing you talk and you said uh, DNA fingerprinting would have an impact on paternity testing, mm -hmm. on crime, on immigration yep. cases. Can you describe the first cases that you were involved in? Yeah, right? there was a family living in London where the youngest boy in the family, the uh, authorities thought he wasn't a member of that family, had been right. swapped around. And he was actually faced with deportation. Gosh. They were going to fly him out of the country back to the, their original country, mm -hmm. uh, which was in Africa, Ghana. Um, so we did the DNA testing on the mother, this boy in dispute, and brothers and sisters. And in fact, the very results, the very initial results that come from that are shown here. Right. So these are the DNA fingerprints um, of this family. Now, if you look through here, it, it's so easy to analyze. Yeah. So you look at the genetic characters, these stripes. Mm -hmm. So have a look at this character here. And Where's he got it from? He's got it from mum. Yeah. And she's also passed it on to, to one of his uh, brothers and sisters. Random. And it's there, isn't it? You yeah. just can see simple it like that. that. Yeah. So conclusion was that boy was a full member of the family. It's as simple as that. Sir Alex's department was also asked to verify the family credentials of someone who became quite a celebrity. Dolly the Sheep was famously claimed to be the first ever cloned mammal, an exact copy of her mother with identical DNA. I understand you've worked with a very famous sheep. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that, please. Oh, yes, that was very fascinating. When we were contacted, uh, whether we would do DNA analysis and verify that Dolly she is really a clone. And how were you able to prove that Dolly was a clone? I got, first of all, blood mm -hmm. from Dolly, mm -hmm. which you see here. Then I got um, the mammary tissue from which Dolly derives, as shown here. 
Before you make a clone, you have to make a cell culture, and this lane is the, based on the DNA of this cell culture. And as you can see, all these three lanes are absolutely identical. It's terribly clear, isn't it? It's really <laughs> yeah. obvious. That's the beauty of DNA fingerprinting. It's so... it's obvious, mm. yes. But it wasn't quite so obvious for the police during a multiple murder investigation in Leicestershire. In 1983, 15-year-old Linda Mann was walking to her friend's house in Narborough when she was attacked and murdered. Three years later, another Leicestershire schoolgirl, Dawn Ashworth, was also attacked and killed in the same area. As a result of our inquiries, we arrested a young man named Buckland. He admitted responsibility for the murder of Dawn Ashworth, but he didn't make any admissions in respect of uh, Linda Mann, and we were quite certain that whoever had murdered one had murdered the other. Various samples from the victims, the accused, and from the evidence left at the crime scene were sent to Professor Jeffrey's lab for analysis. These are the DNA profiles, stripped down DNA fingerprints from this uh, murder investigation. This right. is DNA from the first victim. Right. You can see two bands yes. there. That was actually from uh, DNA from hair roots taken post mortem from right. that, that girl. And then that is a DNA profile of the murderer. Right. Right, now we go to the second victim. This was her DNA, band down there and a band right. up here. And then we had two trace amounts of DNA from the murderer, in the case of the second victim. Very faint, but if you look very, mm. very carefully, I hope you can see yeah, a no, pair of bands the, there, yes. and a pair of bands there, mm. looking very suspiciously like the two yes. bands up here. Yes. So the police were right. Yes. That whoever killed the second victim killed, killed the, the first, first one, one as well. Yeah. Very strong evidence indeed. What about the young man who confessed? That's his DNA profile. Oh, goodness. There's absolutely Mars nothing part, isn't it? like yeah. the murderer. So, conclusion was that this young man, his confession was false. Buckland was released, and the police then knew they were after one man. Keeping faith in DNA fingerprinting, they decided to go down the painstaking route of taking samples from over 5,000 men from the surrounding area. Despite the attempts of the killer to hide his identity by getting a work colleague to provide a sample for him, Colin Pitchfork was eventually identified as the murderer of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. We arrested Pitchfork and within a short period of time Pitchfork admitted both murders and later we submitted DNA tests on Pitchfork which confirmed he was the person responsible for the murder of both girls. DNA fingerprinting has revolutionised police investigation work worldwide and it has changed the way we think about ourselves as unique individuals. This smudgy bit of x-ray film really was the birth of DNA forensics and all the stuff you see on CSI yeah. and everywhere. It all started there. Science has now reached out, it's touched the public and the public are really interested in it. Uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Back at Wild Green, understanding that everyone's DNA is unique will be crucial to the young scientist's next investigation. Now, I look at all of you, you're all totally different, aren't you? You've got different colour hair and different colour eyes and different type of skin. And that's all contained in your DNA. Jane has brought some equipment borrowed from the local secondary school, which will allow Year 6 to try DNA fingerprinting for the very first time. Although in this instance they won't be testing their suspect's actual DNA, the different samples will allow them to scientifically link the blood left at the crime scene to one of the suspects. Now, <laughs> there's not a lot in here. We don't need very much DNA to test. There's the smallest amount, less than a raindrop in here. And the, one of the first things we'll need to do is mix it with, with a colour substance, a coloured liquid, so that we can see a bit more of it. There's a huge amount of scientific equipment to get to grips with, which will call for a lot of dexterity and patience. Put it in and then release it when it's in the bottom. Are you all done on this table? Yes. Yeah. Good. Now we're going to take our gel. Now this is the jelly 
that we're going to use to put the DNA into. Each gel contains eight tracks. A small well sits at the end of each track. Right, I just put it over the well and then just very carefully push it into the, into the well. Keep your thumb right down and then pull it out. Track one is used as a marker to ensure the test is working correctly. Have your pipette set for 20 microliters. You need to take out the little tube with crime scene in it, pick up 20 microliters of that and inject it into well number two. The DNA sample from the crime scene is loaded into well number two, with the remaining suspect's DNA loaded into the other wells. That's it, well done. Keep your thumb right on, keep going. Thumb down, thumb down. Well beautiful. Done, That's Fantastic. beautiful. Well done. That is so neat. Do you know, I'll tell you a secret, I did this with some teachers the other day and they all messed it up. Right, what we're going to do now is run 200 volts through the DNA samples. What that will do, it, it will make the DNA split up. You know when you did the chromatography and you, the, the water separated the colours out and some colours went further than others, didn't they? When we spread the DNA out, the smaller chunks of DNA will go further and then we'll be able to match up people's small chunks next to their big chunks and see if they're the same. OK. Electrophoresis tanks are plugged into power packs and set for 20 minutes at 200 volts. Electricity runs through the gels, spreading out the DNA samples along the tracks and creating their unique fingerprints. So we've run it for 20 minutes, and if I lift the lid off, you'll be able to see that the DNA has spread down the gel. So we very carefully take the gel out and into the staining tray, and then we take this very bright blue stain, completely cover it, just for two minutes. And then once this is done, we'll rinse it off. And what we're looking for... Oh, oh nice. Can you see some lines there? Yep. Well, that's our DNA fingerprint. The science of DNA fingerprinting is allowing extensive progress with cloning, social issues and crime solving. So will it help Year 6 solve their crime scene investigation? You can just stand here. The suspects are brought before them and forensic scientist Robin Slater from West Midlands Police is on hand to interpret the results. OK, and we can see there's a clear match there. So which of these unlikely suspects will be accused of the crime? <laughs>